The battle for mid-priced smartphones is really heating up. And someone asked me what my dream smartphone would be. If I could pick any specs, if I could pick any camera combination, what would I be, how much would it cost, what would I compromise on? And I think that I have put together a list of specs here that would satisfy the majority of people that most people would be pretty happy with and someone like myself would be extremely happy with. Now, the entry starting price for this device, because it is a budget device, is going to be $349. I think $349 right now is a really, really sweet spot as it's much cheaper than most of the other Snapdragon 865 devices. It's a little bit more expensive than the Snapdragon 730 devices. And overall, it kind of hits this sweet spot for being accessible to most people in most areas. We are going to start this off with the Snapdragon 768 or the Dimensity 1000T chipset. Both of these chipsets are relatively close to each other in performance, maybe with the Dimensity chip edging out the 768 in some benchmarks. Why am I choosing these CPUs? Well, these CPUs are gonna be significantly cheaper than the 865. Next up is the camera. Now, you guys know that I love me some cell phone photography. You guys know that I think that smartphone cameras are maybe one of the most important aspects of smartphones that we should pay attention to. As for the majority of people, our phone, this device right here, has replaced the majority of people's point and shoot cameras. If you guys can remember, seven, eight years ago, if you went to a party or it was someone's birthday, you would bring your little point and shoot camera and then you'd have to go home and then share the photos that way. And it was a pain in the fucking ass. Now, everyone just brings their phone. So in reality, our smartphones are giving us two devices. They're giving us our pocket point and shoot camera and they're giving us our communication device. And for some people that it would be the ultra power user, they're giving us a computational device as well. So what cameras am I gonna pick for this? Am I gonna go all out with the cameras? Actually, I think you guys are gonna be surprised. For this budget device, I'm gonna go with either the IMX 686 or the 586. Uh, if I'm gonna go for the Snapdragon, if I'm gonna go for the Sony IMX 586, that's really because the camera on the K20 Pro was extremely close in performance to the camera on the K30 Pro but the IMX586 is gonna come in at a cheaper price. Now, you guys know I want me some optical image stabilization, so I'm gonna combine either of these two sensors with optical image stabilization. And because a lot of people are trying to create content on their devices, smartphone blogging is now, vlogging is now a thing, uh, I'm gonna give it an ultra wide camera, but I'm not gonna give it any potato ultra wide camera. I'm gonna give it the IMX363. What's the IMX363? It's the great camera that was in the Poco F1. Now, that's gonna be my ultra wide camera and it's going to give us something like 112, 118 degree field of view, something around an 18 or a 16 millimeter focal length equivalent. Nerd alert! And I'm going to combine that ultra wide camera with optical image stabilization. Even though it's something that most camera manufacturers or most phone companies don't do, I'm doing two cameras. One's, in, one's a normal lens, let's say a 28 millimeter on the IMX 686, which would make that lens easier to construct. And then for the ultra wide, we're going to go with something like a 18 or a 20 millimeter also with optical image stabilization, and that camera is 13 millimeters. Why is it important, in my opinion, to have optical image stabilization on both, device, on both lenses? Because when low light becomes a factor. Damn, are you guys enjoying this video and you wanna support me? Best way to do that is hit the subscribe button. If you guys wanna interact with me, Twitter's an excellent place to do so. Also, check out my Telegram channel in the description down below. And if you guys wanna put some money into my pocket, just use my affiliate links. Okay. Back to the video. Electronic image stabilization falls apart and it's, 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 it's pretty bad to be honest. Um, 
Now, on top of the elect on, on top of the optical image stabilization, I'm also going to want to implement some type of post processing metadata image stabilization. And I'm gonna to touch on that in the end of this video for all of the nerds that want to know more about it. Next, we gotta talk about storage. I'm gonna go with either UFS 3.0 or UFS 3.1 storage and LP DDR5 RAM. These are the top of the line specs in regards to storage, speed, and RAM. But that's okay because we're saving a little bit of money with the CPU. Uh, devices like the Redmi, K30 come with UFS 3.1 and LPDDR5. And the Redmi K30 Pro starting price is like $350. And so I think that for my budget device starting at a similar price point, having fast storage speed and fast RAM is very, very acceptable. Next up, we gotta talk display. Now you guys know I'm not a big fan of high refresh rate displays. I don't think that they add really any more functionality to the overall user experience than a 60 hertz display. That said, if we can find it within that $350 budget to implement a 90 hertz variable refresh rate display, that is an area that I would be willing to, to spend some more money and sacrifice maybe the IMX 686 for that variable refresh rate display. Going from the 686 to the 586 for a 90 hertz variable refresh rate display, I think is a good trade-off. What is a variable refresh rate display, you ask? It's a display that can go from anywhere from like one to two hertz all the way up to 90 hertz, depending upon what the software is asking for it. So what that means is that if I am quickly scrolling through Instagram, the display ramps up to 90 hertz. If I'm slowly scrolling through Instagram, it is locked at maybe 55 hertz or 60 hertz or 68 hertz or 69 hertz, ha ha ha, 69. Um, and so by doing that, we can satisfy some of the people that want the high end refresh rate for gaming without taking that big of a hit on battery life. If that's not in the budget, I'm fine with a 60 hertz AMOLED panel. If I can get over a thousand nits of brightness, for the outdoor viewing angles so that you can see your phone in the direct sunlight so that if you go to the beach and you want to snap a picture and look at it with friends, you don't have to do the shading thing with your hands because high brightness displays actually make your devices more functional to use and easier to use in a variety of conditions. Whereas high refresh rate displays, yeah, you know what I'm getting at. Next up, as we're talking about the display, we got to talk about the notch now. I don't like notches, but I thought that the notch on the Xiaomi Mi Note 10, that little water drop thing up at the top, it is so inobtrusive in regards to, to interrupting my notifications. To be honest with you guys, the punch hole notch on the Mi 10, I dislike it because now all my notifications are pushed over to the other side and I find it to be just kind of overall less, it's just, it's just less convenient, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit less convenient. That's my feelings on that. So Mi Note 10, little teardrop notch, teardrop display. If they want to do an infrared camera so that we can go ahead and have facial unlock in the dark, that's fine. Don't really care so much about that though. Next up, fingerprint scanner. The in-display fingerprint scanner of the Xiaomi Mi 10 is good. It's not as good as the side-mounted fingerprint scanner of my friend's Redmi Note 9 Pro, and it's not as good as the fingerprint scanner on the Poco F1 that I had. So for that reason, we're either going with a rear-mounted fingerprint scanner or we're gonna go with a side-mounted fingerprint scanner. I just find that picking the device up, having my finger there resting where it is, I don't have to do the finger gymnastics of trying to find the area of the screen to put my finger in. It's just more functional. And then talking about the side mounted fingerprint scanner, we gotta talk about the construction. Now, for the construction of this device, we're not going metal, we're not going glass. I want the Poco F1 style polycarbonate or 
I would love to have the Nokia Lumia style uh, unit body made from one piece of polycarbonate type of body because specifically the way that they use that injection molt or the, the milling for the polycarbonate, um, the device was one color all the way through. So no matter how much you scratched it, it, you, it would never show scratches. If they want to give us a frosted finish to hide fingerprints, that's even better. But I think that with this lineup of features, a polycarbonate body gives us the most functionality. And talking about the back of the device, it's going to come to battery and camera hump. Now, charging speeds. You guys know I'm not a huge fan of the ultra super duper high wattage charging, but, but uh, I would be happy with a 4,500 to 4,700 milliamp hour battery if it could adopt the Qualcomm Quick Charge 5.0 charging standard, which divides the battery into two cells that would be great. That means that the device could charge at over 100 watts, but Quick Charge 5.0 is not supported by uh, the Dimensity 1000 chipset, and it's not supported yet by the Snapdragon 700 series of chipsets. None of the chips in that range support the splitting of uh, voltage into high amperage for two cells. So if we only have the regular 27 or 33 watt Xiaomi fast charging, um, I think that's I think that's okay. Uh, because with a 4,700 milliamp hour battery and a 90 hertz variable refresh or a 60 hertz display um, at 1080p, I think we're gonna get pretty good battery life, especially with the Snapdragon 700 series chip. Uh, talking about the camera hump, I want little to no camera hump on the back of it. It scratches your lenses. It is not that attractive. And I think there's just, there's better solutions or just give me more battery capacity. Now to wrap up and close on what the metadata type of image stabilization is. We live in a world now where the chipsets in our devices are as powerful, if not more powerful in some cases, especially when it comes to H.265 video encoding and decoding as low end laptops. And so our devices also have a gyroscope that can measure where the device is uh, within space and time. There's other companies such as Insta360 that use data recorded by the internal gyroscope of their cameras to then stabilize the footage after the fact. The way I want to implement this because using this type of image stabilization that's based on metadata, you can stabilize this footage at any place in time. You can, you can stabilize it when the device is charging. You can put it onto the computer and have your computer do the image stabilization. The way I want to implement this is pretty simple. Um, you are, you are able to, activate EIS based on metadata when using the device. When the device goes on to charge, the device uses that period while it's charging to stabilize your footage in post-production without you having to think about it. You put your device on the charger, any videos that you had left in queue start being stabilized, your apps update normally, the moment you take it off the charger, it, it stops. It stops stabilizing the video. Um, and I think that doing something like this is a really, really elegant workaround so that we're not left with shitty image stabilization so that it doesn't suffer in low light. And it's a more accurate way of stabilizing the, uh, the, the, the footage. Um, and I think that at the 300 to $375 mark, I think that this device is going to be able to satisfy most gamers, most smartphone photography enthusiasts with a good ultra wide camera and a good main camera. It's 
It's gonna satisfy the high refresh rate people. It's gonna satisfy mom and dad that just want a good pocket phone that they can pull out and it works smoothly. Operating system wise, um, you guys know that I love MIUI, but I, because I don't specifically have an Android manufacturer in mind for this, I'm just as happy for it to use stock Android or MIUI or Oxygen OS or Realme OS or Color OS. Um, I don't really care about the skin per se, but this is my idea of the ultimate mid-range ultimate budget device. I want you to let me know what your like dream budget device is. Put a realistic price tag on this, like I did. Make some compromises where you have to. Tim, partner, you might be sad that this video is over, but don't worry. Go ahead and check out this video right here. It might be a camera comparison. Or check out this video right here where I talk about headphones. Either way, I'll wait for you. Still waiting.